everyone and welcome back to Future Plymouth. Thanks very much for joining us today. My name is Miles Noble from Altitude and I'll be your MC this afternoon. Uh, we've got a really great topic. Uh, today's uh, topic is retrofitting buildings, the elephant in the room. And as always, we've got a really fantastic panel with us. Um, so first off, uh, shortly you'll be hearing from Jenny and David Pierpoint from the Retrofit Academy. Uh, and they're going to discuss the challenges uh, and issues of making existing buildings uh, perform better and how uh, getting certified as a retrofit assessor, uh, assessor can support this effect. Uh, next, we'll have Doug Eltham uh, from Devon County Council uh, and also uh, on the Devon Climate Emergency. Yeah and the Devon Crime Emerging, and he's going to give us an update on the outcomes of the Citizens' Assembly, uh, with particular focus on the desire to retrofit existing building stock. And then finally, we're going to hear from Claire Pierce and Nadine, uh, Nadine Boltz uh, from the Low Carbon Devon team and the University of Plymouth. Uh, and they're going, to, they're going to talk to us about um, the highly successful retrofit of the Sustainability Hub at the University of Plymouth, uh, it's making it the highest retrofit SKA gold rating, uh, which was our ERDF funded. So a really great lineup. Thank you so much for joining us. As usual, uh, at the end of the programme, we'll have our Q&A, but please submit your questions either in the chat box or in the Q&A button as we go throughout the build uh, throughout the programme. Uh, and we'll, we'll answer some of your questions at the end. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Jenny and David. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Everyone hearing is loud and clear. That's All okay. Good okay. Um, are, we, are we good to go? It's hard okay. when you're doing this to a blank screen. Okay, brilliant. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining, and thank you very much for the opportunity to. Um, to attend today and speak to you about the uh, the things we're doing in the retrofit space and the challenges we face as a nation um, around retrofit. 
Um, we're doing a bit of a double act today. So I'm Jenny Pierpoint. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Retrofit Academy um, Community Interest Company. Um, my partner in life and in crime, David Pierpoint, is going to be presenting some of this alongside me. Um, and we will uh, we will take you through the um, the reasons that retrofit is a problem, um, some of the challenges we're facing as a country, what we're doing about those, and then specifically we can talk about um, a project that we are just about to start in Devon, a really exciting project, and we can talk to you about that. Um, so uh, okay, so if we can have the next slide, please, that'd be wonderful. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. So about the Retrofit Academy uh, Community Interest Company. So who are we? Um, so we are a community interest company, um, which means we are striving to make an impact um, to the community as in retrofit impact. So we, we want to, uh, our vision is uh, for a world where um, all homes are um, ha uh, healthy and, and low carbon. Um, we, uh, we develop uh, retrofit qualifications. So we have a number of qualifications now in our suite of training retrofit coordinator, right through to advisor, assessor, and an introductory course called Understanding Domestic, um, uh, domestic Retrofit. Uh, we shape thinking, so we're not just a training provider. We, um, we, we are sort of uh, thought leaders in retrofit and how we can address this challenge. We're a trusted um, advisor and provider to government. So recently have um, worked with government on the Green Homes Grant um, Skills Training uh, Project. A uh, really successful project where we trained over a thousand, one thousand one hundred twenty-seven people actually, in in retrofit, um, and we've done a number of uh, a, a number of different similar uh, contracts uh, for the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Um, we support industry too, so we work with Trustmark, the accreditation, uh, the quality mark for uh, for retrofit and the energy efficiency sector. So we're trusted by them, um, and they're a key partner of ours. Um, we also have a membership organisation, uh, so this is how we support those people that we train and other organisations as well um, to be really good um, in terms of practising what they learn. So it's not good enough really from our perspective to just train people. What we want to do is make sure that when they go out there into the big wide world, they're actually able to do their jobs really, really well because this is a really important thing they're doing. So we have membership of over 500 individuals and organisations. Um, we run events, we run uh, webinars and summits, we provide best practice um, and CPD and a whole host of things through our membership organisation. Um, specifically, we have um, over 100 local authority members of, um, of the Retrofit Academy. Um, we've, we've, uh, we've grown hugely in terms of our members recently um, and we, we, we're continuing to grow. So we have a really good um, a number of local authority members and um, members from the social housing sector as well. Um, deliver major projects. So I will get on to talk about this a little bit later, but uh, we've just recently secured two projects through the um, something called the Community Renewal Fund. You may have heard of it. Um, it's bridging funding basically to uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, after the EU funding, EU structural funding came to an end. Um, th this funding is now going to support community uh, projects, community renewal projects, and we're working in Devon and in Essex on, on, on two of those. Um, we also create jobs in retrofit. So we're supporting the growth of what is a very new embryonic sector. Um, really want to support this army of retrofit professionals and support the, the retrofit economy. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a big part of what we do, working with uh, lots of different partners to do that. Um, and finally, um, we are um, involved in um, fostering a retrofit community. So we will be running the whole house retrofit zone at Future Build, an exhibition in, uh, in Excel next March, um, bringing together um, the sort of demand side and the supply side of retrofit and fostering that, uh, that uh, retrofit community. Um, so that's uh, a little bit about us. Okay, so retrofit. Um, why is this a problem? Uh, the scale of the challenge. So you may know this already, um, but it's a pretty big, it's a pretty big elephant in the room, really. The size of this elephant is pretty enormous. Um, so some numbers for you. Um, we have 27 million homes in this country that need to be retrofitted. And the government are investing billions of pounds in this through various different types of funding, LADS funding, social housing decarbonisation fund, that sort of thing, the eco sector. Um, so it, it's a huge challenge in terms of numbers. 
Um, 24% of the carbon in the uh, UK is actually generated from our housing stock. Um, it's, uh, we could make a huge dent in the government's target for net zero if we can start to address um, some of that. Um, Timescales are a massive challenge. So uh, we have our net zero target of 2050, clock's ticking. We have 29 years to decarbonize our housing, our housing stock, and, and actually there's some cities and regions are being far more ambitious than that. Um, so uh, timescales are a huge challenge. Um, we also have a challenge in, in, the, in the fact that, so if, you, if you just kind of translate that 29 years um, and then work out how many houses need retrofitting, puts it into context quite starkly, really. Um, it actually translates as one house needs to be retrofitted every minute between now and 20, 2050. So that's a huge challenge. And, uh, you know, we're making a very small dent at the moment. And, you know, we need, we need, to, we need to really expand that. Um, and the final challenge really is the nature of the supply chain and the retrofit sector itself. It's very young, it's embryonic. Um, the, there's, there's demand there. Is there a supply chain there? You know, how, how can we actually provide the, um, the employers with the skills that they need in order to meet the demand that, that, that is out there? Um, so th this is an area that we're working on as well. And much of this is because funding um, has, has been um, that there is a, a lack of capacity in terms of the numbers of people who can do proper retrofit work to the required quality and, and the capability to deliver. So the scale of the challenge there is, 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 pretty, is pretty big, really. So now I think some nasty pictures are going to appear in sequence now. Um, re retrofit gone bad. So these are real life examples of, um, of properties um, with, with some quite significant problems, as you'll see, mold, damp, um, terrible installation. And now it will probably shock you or surprise you to know that these are pictures of domestic properties that have already been retrofitted. So these are not properties that has had nothing that, that have been untouched. These are properties that have been retrofitted to, as you can see, a really, really poor standard. This one here is showing how insulation has been kind of cut around a porch, which is going to create a pretty bad thermal bridge, completely negating the whole point of retrofit. And there will still be heat leakage and, and carbon leakage through there. So these, these are examples of, of um, where retrofit is, has not been project managed very well where there's been a lack of um, quality installation and there's been very, very poor assessment and then evaluation of those projects. And a case study here, a case in point um, is uh, some government funding, quite, quite a lot of it, five million pounds spent in Fishwick, Fishwick, um, up near Preston. So five million pounds scheme, 2013, hundreds of properties retrofitted. And these are some of the pictures of, of after um, after the after the retrofit. So as you can see, some poor workmanship on the roof line for a start going to lead to an awful lot of uh, water ingress and damp. Um, you can see that the evidence of damp in the pictures at the bottom, um, defective installation, no design, so not properly designed, no ventilation, which is absolutely critical. Um, there's no point kind of wrapping a building in a great big blanket and not allowing it to breathe. It's just going to, just going to get really damp and mouldy and be a vile place to live. So widespread damp and mould. And, and actually what will happen is the, the installer sort of went bust. And in terms of putting this work right, because these are places that you know real people live in, um, the cost of that remediation work was estimated at six million. So actually 11 million pounds worth of, of public money was spent on, on, on this um, and it cost more than twice what it should have because it wasn't properly managed, coordinated, designed. Um, and, and to, a, to a proper standard. So obviously the cost um, is to people's lives. People are living here. Um, and the, the kind of things that happen when you live in properties like this is you get asthma, you get um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, you get all sorts of problems. Elderly people you know, will, will, will trip and fall because damp, flo damp floors are, are very slippery. And, and that, 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 costs, that costs the country an awful lot of money and, and is an in, in impact on the quality of people's lives. So uh, we're not talking about um, just buildings here, we're talking about people's lives. Um, so that's an example of what went wrong. And there are many, many of those. And this is therefore 
uh, the government's response to putting that right. So I'm sure you've all heard of the Each Home Counts report. Uh, so the government commissioned that, um, and th this was uh, looking at quality in the energy efficiency sector. And out of that, one of the recommendations um, was that Trustmark, um, the government's quality scheme, would uh, wrap its arms around the energy efficiency sector. Um, and the second uh, recommendation was the development of a code of practice to standardize um, and provide a quality, um, a quality sort of level um, for all ed energy efficiency works. That, that, was, uh, that, that resulted in um, the BSI PAS 2035, which is all of the retrofit sort of professional roles and BSI 2030, which is the installer side. Um, so um, I'm lo loving the animation here. So Trustmark requires full compliance. So all those people who are accredited with Trustmark to work in the energy efficiency sector, they need to be fully compliant with uh, PAS 2035 and PAS 2030. And there's going to be another arrow. Here we go. Um, all the government funded schemes um, also need to be fully compliant with Trustmark. So it's, um, it's quite a virtuous circle, really, and it locks everyone into this quality standard. Um, so this is where PAS 2035 came from, uh, which is driving the need for uh, training and development and support of these roles that you can now see on screen. So PAS 2035 introduced these six roles um, to make sure that retrofit projects were um, completed and managed um, against their quality standard. So we have a retrofit advisor, that person up front providing quality retrofit advice to the, to the customer, a retrofit coordinator, a project manager, holding it all together, making sure it's all done properly, the retrofit assessor providing really good quality um, surveys and assessments, uh, the retrofit designer going to design all the uh, retrofit measures, make sure it all works properly, uh, select the appropriate technologies and products, um, the retrofit installer um, going to actually uh, install those measures and then um, the retrofit evaluator sign it off at the end make sure there's a proper handover and everything is done in, in accordance with the project's scope and uh, is delivered properly so those are the past 2035 roles um, the critical one and one that we um, this is the, our flagship training course really is the retrofit coordinator role the project manager that holds it all together so PAS 2035 introduced this, this professional role, a specialist retrofit project manager, whose, um, whose job it is to take overall responsibility. These words you're seeing on screen are taken from PAS 2035. So take overall responsibility for, for retrofit projects, uh, making sure they're done properly at all stages in accordance with, uh, with PAS 2035. They also have um, a, ro a role in making sure that um, they protect the interests of um, the client as the commissioner and specifier of the works, but critically of, of the public. So, you know, the people who live, people who live in these houses are going to be retrofitted, making sure that um, it, it's all done properly because that's that's what's in the public's interest at the end of the day. So um, it introduced that, that critical role. Now, I'm going to hand over to David, who's going to talk to you about this rather complicated diagram, which he will simplify for you, <laughs> and, and talk to you about the six stages of, of a PAS-compliant retrofit project. Great to be here. Lovely to, to, to meet you all um, to an, a limited extent. Um, yeah, so a flowchart appears and I start talking. It's really not because I'm a technical expert. It's because what the Academy is here to do is to help translate um, what is a very dense standard um, into um, easily digestible form, really. Um, there are all sorts of bells and whistles in PAS 2035, as you'd expect from a, a tightly packed 90 page document. But if just I think the vast majority, you probably just need to understand this process. Um, uh, effectively, what the PAS is there to do in a six step process is to identify what this project is there to achieve. What are its intended outcomes? What, when we ask people to spend 15, 20,000 pounds on their homes, if, that, if that's the appropriate budget, what are the things we're trying to achieve with that? It could be a whole range of things from uh, achieving a certain uh, performance standard to improving indoor air quality. Uh, reducing energy bills by a particular uh, percentage, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, step two is carrying out a risk assessment on a dwelling. 
Uh, so the PaaS, as I'll show you, I have a slide in a moment, puts all the risks, uh, all, all projects into a particular risk pathway. And then it says, once you're in that risk pathway, this is how you must manage them. These are the people who must be involved. This is the process you must follow. Uh, it's a very simple process. Um, dwelling assessment is the process of visiting a, an individual property and gathering data about it to help inform and make the right decisions for that property and the people who live in them. It's not in itself where those decisions are made because the people conducting those assessments are, unless they're appropriately qualified and skilled to do so, aren't able to do that. Um, they have in the past been doing that and the PAS, is, PAS has put an end to that practice. So it's about gathering data and the appropriate data that a retrofit coordinator and a retrofit designer needs to do step four. Um, the planning and design stage. Now, critical to this is the fact that we have, as I say, 27 million homes in this country. I can assure you that whilst there are many archetypes uh, which have much in common, there are no two buildings which are exactly the same. And the PAS recognises this to the extent that it says that every home individual dwelling must be assessed and an individual plan to retrofit that property to decarbonise it to its fullest potential must be put in place before we start installing stuff. And this is a very, very welcome change in philosophy from the government because previous funding regimes have funded individual measures, allowing a minister to stand up in parliament and announce how many how many boilers have been installed or how many walls have been clad. Um, and that's entirely the wrong way to deliver a net zero retrofitted uh, UK. So it's about doing the right things for the right property in the right sequence and the right order. Um, it also recognises that in the majority of cases, um, a retrofit won't be a one hit. Um, it will probably be done in, in, in a few different phases, many, many over, over a period of often 15, 20, 25 years. Um, it's that pathway to net zero that we're looking for here. So there's an awful lot of these um, uh, what we call medium term retrofit plans being developed at the moment off the back of much improved uh, dwelling assessment. And then step five is around installation and handover. That is an installer doing what uh, a coordinator and designer have decided should be done, um, which is very different from uh, the past, where effectively we jump straight from a fairly superficial assessment of a dwelling to that installation and hand, uh, installation of measures. It's where the installer wants to get to as quickly as possible, really. Um, and we, we want that to be a quick process, but we want it to be done thoroughly and well, too. And then step six is just about ensuring that those intended outcomes that were, were promises, really, that were made to the person whose money it was in the first place, have been kept. Um, it sounds like a really arduous process, but usually it's just a simple customer satisfaction survey, which checks in that that has happened, that there's been no nasty unintended consequences. Um, so for those of you in, in the broader world of construction, if I show you that and say, that's, a, that's our process for delivery. I don't think many of you will be phased by it in any stretch of the imagination. Um, the energy efficiency industry itself has kicked and screamed a little bit about it since its introduction two years ago, as you might expect, but they're getting there. And we are now finding increasing numbers of people um, doing building very successful businesses around this methodology. Crucially, and if you only take one thing away from today's presentation, please take this. Crucially, we have these retrofit coordinators involved from the very first stage to the right at the end. Um, in fact, in the absence of any such thing as a retrofit evaluator, the retrofit coordinator is also doing the evaluation at the end. Um, and um, the, I'm stressing this point because that's what the PAS says must happen, that they must oversee the whole process. But unfortunately, there is a side to the industry which is trying to um, cut corners within the PAS and are bringing in retrofit coordinators right at the end to sign things off retrospectively. Um, so if you do work for a local authority or a social landlord with budget to spend on the PAS 2035, please be very wary of organisations who say that that's PAS compliance. It really isn't. As I mentioned earlier, the PAS also uh, triages projects into low, medium or high risk categories. And then it says who can do what in each of the six stages. Um, so you see the retrofit coordinator is very prevalent within there. There are certain things they can do directly. There are certain things they can do if they're also qualified to be a designer. 
Um, there's an oversight role in the installation and handover phases, phases and then there's a temporary role as an evaluator. Um, so uh, it's pretty clear um, and has been clear for quite a while now. Um, there is an imminent change, an update to pass 2035, which will say that a retrofit coordinator can't um, can't do the path B, the medium risk design, unless they're also qualified as a, as a retrofit designer, which means being a, a qualified coordinator, uh, sorry, a qualified architect uh, or other construction professional. Um, now, the, the real elephant in the room isn't really the 27 million retrofits. It's the fact that if we want to deliver even a million retrofits, we're gonna need hundreds of thousands of people to do that. And these numbers from a new economics foundation report highlight where we think those roles are and what the gaps are um, if you are in construction i would guess at a minute you're pretty busy if you're any good you're going to be really busy um, therefore the opportunity of moving into this sort of fairly fragile and new area of retrofit might not be that attractive so in the vast majority of these cases we need to bring these people from outside of the existing professions and outside of the existing trades in order to plug the skills gaps um, this slide gives you a bit more a uh, bit more granular detail on where they might be uh, what sorts of roles are going to be really important um, again taken from the new economics foundation um, now, the critical thing to take away from this slide, though, is don't look at the detail of it. Look at how the bar charts get bigger and bigger each year. Um, and the reason for that is that um, the, with, with the declining number of years and the unchanging number of retrofits to be delivered, um, the number of people we're going to need to hit those targets is going to go up and up and up at a rate that, you know, that it's, it's, it's quite terrifying. So that number of 400,000, 429,000 will very quickly become 600,000 unless we get a bloody move on. Um, now I'm going to finish my slightly techie section just by talking to you about a Three, three of the core principles which sort of underpin PAS 2035 and all the training that we develop. Um, sure, this is familiar to many of you. Um, the first of those core principles is what we call the fabric first approach to retrofit. Um, we were talking, the panel were talking about heat pumps just before this session. The government seemed to be laboring under the misapprehension that we can install heat pumps to um, buildings that have not had their fabric improved to a decent standard and that they're still going to be economically viable and um, deliver the, the cost savings and the environmental benefit that they're meant to. It's absolute nonsense. Unless you reduce the demand for that heat as much as you feasibly economically and realistically can you know, you you cannot go around installing renewables um on top and, and expect to get any sort of sensible result so fabric first is really really important um second key concept is whole house retrofit the idea that when we're looking at a building we are considering it as a, a whole and we're looking at the building fabric first but not the building's fabric only in other words, we're creating a plan to retrofit that property, which addresses the fabric, the services and renewable energy systems, usually in that order. OK, so please uh, do get in touch with your MP about the, uh, the government's failure to grasp this fairly simple concept. Um, I'll give you uh, one example of where our jobs and where, does, where they're quite tough sometimes and where there is a, a balance between good practice, the benefits of going really low in terms of carbon savings and the economic costs of doing so. Um, and what you're seeing here, um, this relates to the third key aspect, which is building physics, really, the appreciation of building um, and its thermal performance and its uh, sort of the risks associated with moisture in buildings are, are, are sort of pretty, pretty fundamental to retrofit. And what you see here is um, is what happens when you apply external wall insulation to an existing building and you leave the window where it was as in you that's the green rectangle at the bottom the window it's been left where it was before in the existing wall that ewi has been applied to ewi's external wall insulation and you can see that the thermographic detail there shows the thermal bridge that results of the, from that when when that, that is not appropriately um uh, dealt with and what you see here on the right hand side is is a very good practice detail where that window has been moved in line uh, and uh, that thermal bridge has been eliminated meaning there won't be issues with that damp and mold 
um, and, the, and the poor thermal performance that, that Jenny talked about. Now, that is a costly thing to do unless it is well planned, unless it's part of a, what we might call a social housing asset management strategy where they're going to replace the windows anyway. If you're going to do that, of course, you should move them. The reality is that the vast majority of retrofit in this country at the minute, we probably can't afford to do that all the time. Um, and therefore, there are certain trade offs and compromises. And we need people well placed and well knowledgeable around these things like building things, able to make the right decisions at the right time. Um, also, safe in the knowledge, so we talk about a lot that there are workarounds, which means that if you can't get to good practice, you can do an awful lot better than that diagram on the left hand side, just by following some simple rules. Okay, so Jenny's going to finish off now by talking a bit about a few of the projects we have. And thank you for listening. Brilliant. Thank you, David. So I hope that has helped you outline um, the sort of the problems, uh, you know, kind of a macro and, and micro sort of level really around around retrofit. And the way we're trying to solve this is um, uh, one of the ways is through training. So we're, uh, we're largely uh, a large part of what we do is um, is training. So we develop qualifications and then we train people in those qualifications. So we have um, these four that you're seeing on screen now. Uh, level two in understanding domestic retrofit, uh, level three award in uh, retrofit advice, uh, very nearly, very nearly uh, complete, off call pending. A level four award in retrofit assessment, again, off call pending, very nearly complete. And our level five diploma in retrofit coordination and risk management. Those are um, regulated qualifications, um, completely uh, in, in line with, with PAS 2035. Uh, the final one here that you're seeing, Fit for Retrofit, is our uh, bespoke social housing programme, which is specifically designed by, um, by a, a range of people who are with career, career experience in social housing themselves um, to, uh, to um, upskill and coach uh, social housing organizations and associations in, in, in retrofit um, so that they can put together really, really brilliant uh, programs um, uh, in that sector. Um, another example of, of, of our training here is uh, where we've partnered with an organization called Generation, the global charity. Um, to develop something called a retrofit advisor boot camp. Um, this is funded by an international um, Macquarie. It's called. It's an international organisation who uh, are providing funding via sort of corporate social responsibility to generation to uh, work with us to develop a retrofit advisor boot camp. Um, is live at the moment, our very first one. It's very exciting. It started on Monday um, and this is specifically aimed at 18 to 24 year olds needs. So uh, not in education, employment or training. The 10 week intensive program that encompasses employability skills, um, mentoring and obviously the retrofit technical uh, training um, to enable someone to be a retrofit advisor. Um, and this program guarantees interviews. So it's an employability program. So it guarantees job interviews for every um, every every learner on this on this boot camp. Um, so it's it's about trying to create this retrofit army, and we're hoping to well we will be um, including that in in uh, this very exciting project in Devon County with, that we're partnering with Devon County Council to deliver. So um, we've secured a million pounds through the Community Renewal Fund uh, through partnering with Devon. Um, and we will deliver a, a range of uh, technical training um, and upskilling. Um, we will deliver, uh, train the trainer to enable local training providers to also train and be competent in training for those retrofit roles. Um, we're the only trainer for some of those roles at the moment, the only training provider for some of those roles. Um, and we really want others to be able to, to train really well um, in this important sector. So we'll be training the trainer. Um, developing the retrofit assessor qualification as I said that's virtually done but it is part of that program and then creating this legacy of a, a retrofit training infrastructure in, in Devon and beyond um, absolutely and, and beyond Devon and, and really what this gives us the opportunity to do is to um, is to develop the, the Devon retrofit economy so what's the demand for retrofit down in Devon what's the supply side look like and how do we plug that gap um, and, and this is a really exciting thing for us because it's not enough for us to train people um, if those people then don't know where to go and, and, and which organisation will they work in. And if there's organisations out there that need these people, but they can't find them, um, it may well, you know, if, if we don't get this right, it's far more attractive for people to actually train to be an electrician. Um, whereas there's, there's this huge need for, for retrofit. 
So we're really excited about this. This project has started in the past couple of weeks and um, we're, we're super excited to be on that. Um, critically as well, it gives us a chance to, um, so we're doing this ahead of the Social Prosperity Fund, which is the longer term type of funding. Uh, it's also the legacy, the, the legacy from sort of EU um, structural funding really. So it'll give us a chance to really model and get it right in Devon. And then we'll be able to think longer term in Devon about how we get it right through the Social Prosperity Fund. Okay. I'm going to skip um, the movie, Jen. I think we'll we've probably, we've we probably had our time and we shouldn't, uh, yeah, move it um, up. That's fine. So that, that, that brings us to the end then. So I hope that's provided a good flavour of what we uh, what we do nationally and what we're going to be doing down in Devon. Um, we'd be more than happy to speak to people who want to get involved. We're looking to engage really well with employers down in Devon. So we'd be more than happy to speak to, speak to you if you're involved in retrofit um, and would like to be involved in, in our programme down there. But thank you ever so much for your time. Um, it's been great to have the opportunity to speak to you all today. Thank, thank you so much, David and Jenny. Amazing presentation. Um, again, this, uh, this will be uh, on our YouTube channel, hopefully tomorrow. So if you want to watch back, uh, especially study David's chart there in the middle, um, you can go back and watch that later. Um, please keep your questions coming in. There's some great ones coming in. So um, we'll, we'll answer those at the end. Um, but next up, we have uh, Doug from Devon County Council uh, and the Devon Climate Emergency, and he's going to talk about uh, the outcomes of Citizens Assembly. So over to you, Doug. Miles, I can't start my video because the host has stopped it, is what it says, but I'll carry on talking. Um, hi everybody, um, I'm Doug Elton, uh, I work for Devon County Council, there we go, video's on, um, and um, Miles, can you just tell me if people can see my screen? Yeah, that's great Doug, just full yeah. screen now. Great, excellent, okay, yes, yeah, so I work for Devon County Council and um, I'm leading the Devon Climate Emergency Project at the moment. Um, and this is what I'm going to run to you this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, um, the project, how it's set up, uh, how we developed a carbon plan and how we've got to the point of having an interim carbon plan now. And I'm then going to focus on the retrofit actions that are in that plan and then what the Citizens Assembly have recommended on retrofit. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the Citizens Assembly worked. Um, I'm going to tell you what our next steps are and then show you how you can keep up to date with the project, um, which I hope you will. So initially, um, back in 2019, um, we formed a partnership um, that's now up to 29 sort of strategic organisations. It's all the councils in, in Devon, including Plymouth and Torbay and um, Dartmoor and, and Exmoor National Park Authorities, um, plus some voluntary organisations and some other public sector bodies as well. And we are trying to put in place a plan to do Devon's bit to reduce carbon emissions to net zero by 2050 um, at the latest. Um, the at, the, at the latest is quite important. All the partners are very aware that we need to reduce carbon as fast as we can, um, but doing it ahead of a national timescale um, is very challenging. Um, we want to take the opportunity to improve the resilience of Devon's environment while we're doing that. Um, big opportunities to restore habitats, um, and improve water quality and reduce flood risk um, whilst we are um, achieving net zero and um, in doing that we'll be preparing our communities for a warmer world. Um, in case anybody's unfamiliar with the term net zero that, the idea there is that um, essential uses of fossil fuels will be continuing beyond uh, 2050 um, but those will be netted off um, by projects that absorb carbon from the atmosphere. Um, both naturally, such as through tree planting, that's the often cited one, but also hopefully um, technologically as well. Yet to be proven, but hopefully that will happen. Um, so this is our process. Um, I just want to tell you, I'm not going to go through this diagram, just tell you two things about the diagram. The first one is that we had to split the process into these um, two strands, the one at the top and the one at the bottom across the screen due to COVID. It would have just been one strand whereby we, we um, used an online, sorry, a citizens assembly that would have been physical to get ideas as to what we should be doing in Devon to reduce carbon emissions and then use that to produce a plan. And then off we go and deliver the plan. COVID hit 
uh, we wanted to keep momentum. So we did this top row, which was that we produced an interim Devon Carbon Plan, um, which focused on the publicly acceptable ideas that we'd already got from some previous engagement. Um, and then we had this second stream where we reserved the more controversial issues and ideas that come out of the earlier public engagement exercises to put through the assembly to test those. So where we are at the moment is that we are now developing actions responding to what the assembly have said um, and we'll be consulting on how we've done that in March. So essentially we'll be asking the public have the partners listened to the assembly appropriately um, and while we're doing that we're continuing to implement the interim plan and then for August next year um, we'll have the responses to what the assembly have said combined with what the public told us about the interim plan uh, and put that into a final plan um, for next summer. So that's what we're doing in terms of mitigation. I should say there's also an adaptation stream. I'm not telling you about that today, um, just to keep it focused on, on mitigation and um, building retrofit. So what does the interim carbon plan do? Well, it provides a framework. It's very high level. The idea is that we'll have this high level Devon carbon plan. We'll then have uh, local authority level plans underneath that, where the local authorities will pick the bits from the Devon wide plan that they can influence. We'll have parish level plans, um, organisations, big organisations, small organisations, they can look at the Devon wide plan, see all the things that need to happen to get Devon to net zero and pick the bits that they can help with and pick the bits that they can influence as well. So it is a plan for everybody. It's not Devon County Council's plan. It's not the partner's plan. Um, it's essentially uh, almost like a blueprint of everything that needs to happen to get Devon to net zero. And we're encouraging people and organisations to get involved, look at it, choose the bits that they can facilitate and put that in their own carbon plan um, and show us what they're doing. And we're showcasing some of that on the website. In terms of funding, no single organisation will ever have enough money to achieve net zero in Devon. Um, it's going to cost billions. Um, but um, encouragingly, there are investable opportunities there for the private sector. So the private sector will play a huge role um, in this. Um, an example of that would be electric vehicle charging. Um, the private sector is already installing electric vehicle charging where it makes sense for them to do so, where there's already a good amount of traffic where they can get, get some uh, return for what they're doing. And it's then for the public sector organisations to step in and put those charge points where the private sector currently doesn't see a business opportunity. So we're going to need that private and um, public sector mix of funding. Over on the right hand side of the slide there, it just lists the sections that are in the carbon plan, usual suspects. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the built environment part of the plan. So in terms of retrofit, um, I'm going to take some of the numbers um, that you've just heard uh, from the Retrofit Academy and bring those down to a Devon level. So we've got um, almost 600,000 homes in Devon, Plymouth and Torbay, and pretty much every single one of those is going to need a retrofit of some form. Even the houses that are being built right now, um, crazily, will need some sort of retrofit to bring them up um, to um, sort of exemplar standards, which is where we need every house to be by 2050. And we've got 53,000 business premises. Between them, though, the homes and the business premises, that they produce about 42% of Devon's emissions, equally split. So it's about 20% from the homes and about 20% from the business premises. So you can immediately see there it's the business premises that um, sort of uh, per, per building are, are more energy intensive than the homes. But the homes really presents the bigger problem because there are so many of them, so many of them and so many individual people and households making those decisions. Just put the pie chart in there. It's these three, uh, sorry, these four parts of the pie chart here, um, which are the, the, the buildings. So a little bit more about the problem. Pie chart here is showing you um, the existing EPC rating. That's the Energy Performance Certificate Rating of Devon's Homes. And um, the government wants most homes, I think it was all homes, um, but in their clean growth strategy, it's now most homes. Uh, to be banned C by 2035, so that's the interim target. And then for net zero, we need we need pretty much every home to be as close to band A as possible by 2050. So by 2035, that's upgrading 380,000 homes in Devon, and that's five times faster than the current rates um, of, of retrofit. And indeed, we, we need the deep retrofit. Um, that, that, re that isn't really happening at all, but it's certainly five times faster than the types of retrofit that are currently happening. And currently, 
it costs on average about £35,000 to get a home up to sort of band A standards on average. Obviously, if you've got a band G house, it's going to cost a lot more. If you've currently got a band B house, it'll cost a lot less. So what's needed? Um, well, um, I completely agree with what the Retrofit Academy have said about um, needing to have a whole house retrofit approach. Um, but nonetheless, what the Committee on Climate Change did in its further ambition scenario to get the UK to net zero by 2050 was it proposed um, numbers around, the around specific measures that could be put into houses. And we've taken that down to a Devon level um, to show what, what's needed locally. So there's all sorts of insulation measures needed there. Um, solid wall insulation is going to become more prevalent. Um, you can see it's 109,000 solid wall installations by 2050. So it's only about sort of 20% of the housing stock um, that's anticipated to receive solid wall by 2050 under the Committee on Climate Change's scenario to get us to net zero. If we can do more, fantastic. Um, and then the heating tech, obviously heat pumps have been in the press recently, and that is part of the government strategy based on what the Committee on Climate Change um, advised. So again, under that scenario, we're looking at best part 350,000 heat pumps by 2050, um, modest use of district heating connecting existing homes, and they're going to be where you've got um, a high heat demand, a high heat density. So it's um, it, it's not really going to be in the rural areas. Um, it's probably going to be more like inner cities, particularly where you've got a heat source that you could use, maybe a waste heat source, or maybe an energy from waste facility or a large industrial installation. They then say that the remaining houses um, are going to be using uh, a mixture of green hydrogen, hybrid heat pumps. That's where you use either a gas boiler or a hydro boiler um, with, with, a, with a heat pump. Um, and biomass, that will be for the properties um, that are sort of more difficult to uh, increase their air tightness. And then there's also room for a small number of homes using direct electric heating. That will be expensive, um, but it's there as, a, as an option um, for homes where the low, tech, low carbon options uh, won't be appropriate. Low carbon is the wrong phrase there, actually, because the electricity driving those electric, electric heaters uh, will be renewable by that point. But um, yeah, it's where, where the homes aren't suitable for the renewable options, really. And business premises, um, the Committee on Climate Change is a bit lightweight on this one, but um, essentially they're looking for heat pumps to provide a lot of the energy demand in commercial and industrial premises. And because heat pumps are more efficient than the way we currently provide heat to buildings, that will contribute to a 25% reduction in energy demand in these types of premises by 2050. So what do we got in the plan? There are a lot of words on this slide. I'm not going to read them all out. Um, so this is what's in the interim carbon plan already. The two that are in bold on the top left are the two actions that have been identified by the public as being a priority. Um, I should say the public, it's also an organisation we have helping us with this called the Net Zero Task Force. Uh, that's a group of 14 specialists um, led by um, Professor Patrick Devine-Wright at the University of Exeter. Um, and he's joined on that panel by experts in, in transport and energy and behaviour change and finance. Uh, and they've been helping us design the, the, the carbon plan. So the first thing we need to do as a priority is to um, continue um, expanding trials of whole house retrofit. Uh, we've had a trial going on in Devon, a modest trial uh, in social housing stock. Uh, the model is called Energy Sprong. Um, it's come from Holland and um, it's a, a system whereby um, off-site prefabricated panels um, are brought to the property and they are um, insulated panels and they are, um, for want of a better word, bolted around the house and the house gets a new roof and it gets new windows and it gets rewired um, and it gets re-plumbed and the, um, it's actually paid for, the social housing bodies pay for that model through the um, through diverting the revenue that they currently spend on maintenance of their properties, that suddenly gets paid directly to the provider of the energy sprung model. And the provider of the energy sprung model becomes responsible for providing electricity and water and maintenance of those properties. Um, and so at the moment, it only really works at scale. Um, in Holland, they've got the price of it down to less than £40,000 a house. Um, that is a lot of money. Um, and we hope we can get it down further. 
um, particularly as the supply chain picks up um, and skills base picks up. And the second thing is we need to establish a Devon wide energy advice service. Believe it or not, we used to have one and um, in austerity back in about 2010, um, it folded. Um, so that needs to be reinstated and um, it needs to link community energy organisations uh, who will be being trained up through the Retrofit Academy to provide the services that you just heard about to give householders bespoke advice about what needs to be done to their property um, and then handhold them through the installation process and advise them about the um, financial uh, um, support that is available to them in their particular circumstance. That's very much lacking at the moment, even trying to find a, a specification for how to install um, underfloor insulation, for example, is really hard to come by. All sorts of people have been doing it on YouTube, um, but knowing exactly which is the right way to do it is very hard. So that, that one-stop shop, essentially, for people in Devon to get energy efficiency advice will be, will be key. I'll just pick out some of the other ones here. Um, the, the second one up from the bottom on the left, sell the co-benefits um, of living in warm net zero ready homes. Um, this is quite a key one because people do, do you hear the, you hear the price of 35k on average to increase um, the energy performance of your property up to band A. Well, people increase the um, or, or put um, improvements into their home um, that it's quite difficult to to um, pin down what the tangible benefits of them are. For example, double glazing, new kitchens, new bathrooms. Um, these things, um, you know, for example, yeah, the double glazing, that doesn't save, uh, pay for itself through energy savings. Um, it doesn't pay for itself at all, but we value um, the increased security, um, perhaps the aesthetics of the home, perhaps the, um, the less noise that's coming into the home. We value those things. And in our own minds, we agree to pay the cost of the double glazing. Um, similarly, the new kitchen. Um, you know, um, there's very little evidence that a new kitchen increases the value of a house, but we do it because we want the clean lines, we want the fashionable aspect of it, etc. So we need to sell the co-benefits of living in a warm home around our health and comfort. Um, and we need people to value that. And so, and so we start thinking about that in decision making. So when we look at the, the numbers to, to put some cavity wall insulation in the house, we don't think, oh, my energy bill's so low, that's never going to pay for itself. We've got to think about the comfort rating as well. Um, over on the other side of the slide, um, one of the big ones here that the Retrofit Academy spoke about was developing training and reskilling opportunities. Um, and this is a particular opportunity to help workers that are currently in carbon intensive sectors that aren't going to do so well from the climate emergency to reskill. Um, and we see that as a big opportunity actually. Uh, with for the levelling up agenda to use some uh, national government speak, um, perhaps even targeting um, the training and reskilling opportunities to vulnerable and low income um, people in Devon and get them involved in a growing sector um, so that they could you know, have a career for life. And the bottom one there on the right hand side, again, something that the UK did have before austerity is a support service for businesses to help them decarbonize their operations and culture. Because not only are these buildings using energy um, for you know, heat um, and lighting, in the industrial and commercial case, the kit inside those buildings is often using a lot of energy um, for whatever is going on inside those buildings. And they need, they need assistance and advice um, to do that. Often energy is um, not high up on, on the balance sheet. Um, of a business, um, so it's um, not given a high priority. That might be changing, of course, now that the fuel bill is getting higher. Um, but nonetheless, if you've got somebody knocking on the door offering free or heavily subsidised advice um, and saying, look, I can save you money, um, usually they'll take it. And the previous, uh, previous programme uh, had been quite successful. So that's what the Interim Carbon Plan already says. That's already on the website. What did the Citizens' Assembly get up to? So we helped, or we got help from the University of Exeter to recruit a 70 strong panel of Devon's residents. We invited 14,000 initially, uh, and of those about 3,000 got back to us. We sent out another questionnaire to them, asked them a few more questions about them. Um, of those about 1,000 got back to us, and from the 1,000 we selected 70 to be representative of Devon by you know, age and geography, 
um, and income levels and education levels, um, attitudes on climate change, they're all in there. So it was a it was a little representation of Devon. They met online for 25 hours and importantly, for the first eight hours, they were being upskilled in why climate change is being called an emergency. And a big bit of feedback we got from them was that they were surprised, um, or surprised might be the wrong word, um, but they were they were grateful for the upskilling because they had not they they were not not, not felt aware of why climate change is being called an emergency from what they were getting from the popular press. So we need to think about how <laughs> how we can get the million people who live in Devon um, upskilled with eight hours worth um, of engagement around climate change. That's quite a task, um, especially when people who are sort of ambivalent about it or not that interested um, are really hard to engage um, in this area. And the three things that they deliberated, these were the three things that were remaining from the interim carbon plan, were how should we encourage people to reduce car use? How should we encourage people to retrofit buildings? And what should the role of onshore wind energy be in Devon? I'm just gonna to talk to you about what they did, uh, what they said about retrofit. But first of all, their report is online, it's in their own words. Um, Google Devon climate emergency. Um, and you'll find the website and the report from the assembly members is on there. But the first thing they give us is a huge mandate to just get on with implementing the interim carbon plan. They fully understood it's an emergency um, and they felt that we should just be getting on with it as, as um, sort of leadership organisations in Devon. And specifically on retrofit, um, and there's much more detail on this in the document, in their report. Um, so I, I'm paraphrasing here. So please do look at the report if you're particularly interested. They, you could break down their recommendations into four, four sections. The first one was about that awareness piece. Um, yeah, all, pretty much all of the uh, participants felt that we needed much more widespread awareness about what people can do to retrofit their home and improve the energy efficiency and that personal advice needs to be available. Um, so we're sort of fulfilling that already by setting up the, the Devon Energy um, Advice Centre. In terms of funding, um, they all agreed that more financial support needs to be available. That's not really a surprise. Um, they gave a few specifics. Uh, so the idea of green mortgages came up. This is the idea that you get a more preferential uh, interest rate on your mortgage if your home was a higher EPC rating or if you could show your mortgage lender that within a few weeks of moving in or months of moving in, you, you, you didn't um, implement various measures to the property. Um, and uh, they also liked the idea of removing VAT um, on retrofit materials. Uh, and obviously that one, we clearly got to work with national government on that one, that's out of the control of local partners, but we'll put that on the list. Now regulation, um, so you know, two thirds of the assembly um, liked the idea of using regulation to acquire their homes in principle. Um, and they were made aware during the assembly process of an example that had been used elsewhere in the country um, where planning conditions had been put on um, domestic extensions. So if you put a kitchen extension on your house um, through building control, you would be required to upgrade the rest of the property at the same time. Um, so they like that idea. Hasn't been very widely rolled out by many local authorities, but it's something that could be done. And in terms of incentives, um, there aren't many incentives you can provide for this um, other than a more comfortable home um, and better health outcomes, which of course we need to sell, as I already mentioned. Um, but in terms of financial incentives, 71% uh, of them liked the idea of linking council tax and business rate payments to the, the building's energy performance. So again, if you can show that you've got a more efficient property, um, you get some sort of in, uh, discount or rebate um, on those on those fees. There was also concern about making sure that anything that is implemented is equitable, because um, obviously it's it, it can be the poorer members of society that are living in the less well insulated homes. That's not necessarily always the case, um, but you know, is it fair that somebody living um, a wealthy person living in a big uh, B-rated house gets a discount on their council tax when a less well-off person living in a G-rated house who can't actually afford to make it any better uh, doesn't you know so we need to we need to navigate those sorts of issues two more slides um, this one's just to repeat the slides you've already seen just to remind you what the next steps are so we're taking 
the recommendations from the Citizens Assembly. Um, we are discussing those amongst the 29 partners. We're currently in a process where we are getting the elected members in those local authorities and the senior directors um, in the, um, the non-political organisations to sign off a set of actions that we will then consult on in March. So that's that's our next day. So please do keep an eye out for that public consultation and um, tell us whether you think we've listened to the Assembly um, well enough. And the last slide, um, just how you can keep up to date. We issue a monthly newsletter. Um, so you can search for that on Google or, or go to that web address there and sign up. Uh, we're on the various social media platforms and we do have part of the website that provides tips for individuals, but also communities and businesses uh, around how you can get involved and reduce your own carbon footprint. OK, so that is me. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Doug. That was an amazing presentation. Really interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you have loads of questions for Doug. Um, again, please use the Q&A button. There's lots of conversations going on behind the scenes um, tonight, which is great to see. Um, so yeah, please submit your questions. Um, just uh, a note about our next um, programme. So Sarah is um, working really hard, again, behind the scenes to um, uh, confirm our speakers for the next uh, webinar, which is on the 15th of December. Um, please go and register and we'll update you on the topics and who's speaking very, very shortly. Um, but uh, yeah, please bear with us on that. But we're looking forward to seeing you all again on, on the 15th. OK, so before, I, before our Q&A, we've got uh, the lovely Claire Pierce and the lovely Nadine Voltz um, from Low Carbon Devon team, our sponsors. Um, partners and the University of Plymouth and architect and Nadine. Uh, they're going to talk through the highly successful retrofit of the sustainability hub. So over to you, Claire and Nadine. Hi, sorry, I'll start again. Um, say hello, I'm Claire Pierce, the project manager for the Low Carbon Devon project, and I'm joined today by Nadine, Nadine Voltz, who's representing Mitchell Architects. Um, I'll be driving the presentation, um, and Nadine will be doing a section in the middle. So, what we'll be covering today is a little bit of context, just to explain to you what the sustainability hub is, how it came about, um, then I'll hand over to Nadine, who will talk you through the nuts and bolts of the retrofit itself and how it worked in practice. And at the end, I'll just cover some opportunities for any, any of you who are Devon companies, um, building on really what um, the Retrofit Academy was talking about as well with regard to skills, but also support for businesses. So, as I said, I'm the project manager for the Sustainability Hub Low Carbon Devon project. Uh, this is a project that provides an exciting new catalyst for low carbon economic growth in Devon. So it's funded by the European Regional Development Fund. It runs until early 2023, and it's basically in place to support Devon based organisations, so companies, SMEs, to access research and business support. We're based at the University of Plymouth uh, within the Sustainable Earth Institute. Um, and the project itself has four aspects. The very important one for tonight is the sustainability hub, um, which was basically uh, an old building at the university. And we had the vision that we wanted to create a living lab that was actually sustainably designed um, to be a partnership space for businesses, academics, students, graduates, community groups. And that's what we created. The project has other aspects as well. One is a program of carbon reduction across the university's campus. And then we have research and innovation, so the opportunity for Devon companies to work with our industrial research fellows, but also other academics within the university to develop new products and services for the low carbon economy. And then we also have a programme of events and internships, which I'll come to in a little bit. But I'd now like to introduce Nadine, who is representing Mitchell Architects, who oversaw the retrofit of the Sustainability Hub on campus. Thank you, Claire. Um, well, I'm, as Claire said, I'm just going to talk you through a little bit um, of the development of the building, where we started and what we achieved in the end with the retrofit. So 
Um, first of all, you can see the pictures of the existing building, Kirkby Lodge, which is um, how it looked like in 2017 when we took 2017, 2018 when we took over the project. Um, to some of you, it might look familiar. It's on the campus of Plymouth University, but it's pretty much um, hidden in the back. And it was always the home to the Sustainable Earth Institute, but they weren't very happy with the location anymore. They weren't very happy with the building. You can see some of the existing pictures on the inside with the spiral staircase, which was the only access to the first floor and the old asbestos tiles on the outside. Um, so in 2017, um, a feasibility study was undertaken previously to us getting involved in which the idea was already developed to um, renovate the building instead of knocking it down and building a new one. Um, and then in 2018, we submitted a planning application and planning was granted in July 18. Um, if you move on to the next slide, thank you. Um, so first of all, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about how we got to where we got to. <laughs> and, um, it was very important that the Sustainable Earth Institute got a new home and as we wanted to refurbish it, it all fell into place in the same time with the ERDF funded project. Um, but in order to achieve the uh, ERDF funding, we really needed to um, achieve a sustainable approach and we needed to be able to prove that everything we did was sustainable. Um, and therefore we looked at different methods of achieving this and we ended up choosing the SCAR rating for it. Um, so if you move on to the next one, I'm just gonna give a quick overview. So I guess some of you already know the SCAR rating. I saw something in the questions about it already. It was developed um, by Scanson, the RACS and ACOM and it was meant to measure the environmental impact of fit outs and refurbishment only looking at the actual refurbishment and not looking at the structure of the existing building in terms of like when you look at Briam, you get certification already by some of the existing structure but scar rating really is meant to achieve just looking at what's there but not actually taking into account how well it is done already so you do like when you do your initial design you get like an initial you usually you can get an initial consultant involved but if you're not looking at the official rating, you can also just use their online tool, which is free and which is really handy to just get some idea of how you can achieve sustainability with your retrofit, which I thought was really handy. So in the process of the project, we decided on a certain amount of targets, which are the good practice measures, which we targeted. And over on the side, you can see how the different levels are achieved. Um, we targeted 67, um, Good practice measures of which 17 are gateways. Gateways are basically the measures that are, have the highest sustainable impact so you have to achieve them while of the others you can a bit more pick and choose on what you actually want to be using. Um, for us the sky rating was really handy because it gave us an idea of how to start looking at the building and during the whole design process and during the whole construction process, we had um, a SCAR assessor looking over the building, looking over the evidence, giving us advice or telling us where we need to collect more evidence, where we meet, need to maybe look into more detail of it. So I'm just gonna show you a little bit about the building and how we've designed it. So that's the existing ground floor, um, which you can see it's actually not one building, it's two buildings. It's the Kirkby Lodge building and the Portland Muse building. And there was no connection between the two. Um, so the Kirkby Lodge building was used by the Sustainable Earth Institute at the time, but the ground floor was meant as a teaching space. With the columns, it wasn't really usable. It was quite dark because of the small window. And the spiral staircase wasn't very handy to make it accessible to everyone really. The Portland Muse building when we took over was already abandoned and it didn't really have any use at this point of time. So if you swap over to the proposed ground floor, thank you. First thing we did is to open up as much as we could on the ground floor because that was meant to be the collaborative space for the Sustainable Earth Institute. So we opened up um, the windows, we created a bigger opening to the lounge space we replaced the spiral staircase with a platform lift in order to be accessible on all levels and we opened up the Kirkby Lodge building over to Portland Muse. 
which was very, very important for us to create use of the whole building, really. Um, moving on to the first floor, you can see pretty much the same. The building is very um, dense. There's lots of small little offices. There's lots of um, small windows and everything. We, when we did it, as you can see, we took out every as many places as we could. But the scar rating was very handy to look at what we're doing. For example, before you take out anything on the scar rating, you have to um, you have to make an assessment and underwrite why you're taking this out why you cannot keep it, is it not useful for your space, how you're going to get rid of it in terms of can you recycle it, can it be used in any other place, how can it be used maybe. So when you look at the comparison between the existing and proposed first floor, you can see that the office on the top left hand side, we just kept as it was and we didn't even take out the old partitions, we left the partitions, the ceiling, everything in and we just had to fit everything else around it. Um, it's something we probably wouldn't have considered if we just did an, a normal retrofit and taken everything out inside and re like taking back in whatever we needed. But for us, that was a good way of actually looking at the building and looking at what's still positive about it, what aspects can we still use. Um, so I think that's just, just to give you a little overview on how the building looks like. But with the internal fit out, it wasn't really enough for the Sustainable Earth Institute to be seen on campus and to be recognized wherever we are. So the external finish had to be appropriate to show this um, sustainable approach. So we went to change the old asbestos tiles, which had to be removed anyways, because they were broken and leaky. So we had to take them all out. We insulated the first floor wall and put a um, western red cedar cladding on the outside. The cladding isn't treated or anything, so it weathers just naturally. Um, and then we introduced a green wall, which was always um, wanted by the Sustainable Earth Institute, which was part of the idea of the living lab. And then as far as I know, there's quite a lot of research going on with the green wall at the moment. And for us, it was also important because it was the eye-catching factor for people to to recognize the Sustainable Earth Institute and the Sustainability Hub on campus. And I think that's what we achieved very well with this building. So if you move on, I'm just gonna show you a couple of pictures. That's how it looked like when it was just finished. It doesn't look like it right now, because when you get there, you'll see that the green wall has grown a lot <laughs> over time. Um, but in introducing the green wall around the curved building, we actually managed to create an image of the sustainability hub that you can see from any angle that you walk towards the building. Um, so if, you, if you're interested, we can do a little tour through the building because I know university has a little virtual tour. So you can have a look at, at how it looks right now. Shall we start on the outside, Claire? Yeah? Mm. Yeah, there we go. I think you can already see that the um, that the green wall has grown quite a lot, and um, university has got a regular maintenance schedule um, where the green wall gets cut back or um, where some of the plants get replaced whenever they die or whenever something new is needed. Um, and the cladding has weathered. It was it used to be really bright orange, and now it's weathered and looks a lot more grey. So when you when you actually get into the building, you enter on the ground floor in the main collaborative space. <laughs> yeah, there we go. And the collaborative space is just really open. And one thing we're uh, we're quite proud of when we started taking down all the old plaster and all the old plasterboard, we found out that all the old columns are made from natural stone. And we decided not to pack them back in wherever we could. So we kept all the natural stone to make it visible. And we connected the ground floor to the first floor with the um, with an internal green wall as well, which as far as I hear from people using it is very handy to reduce the noise between the two levels. So everyone can actually work there and talk without everyone upstairs hearing every word that's said downstairs. So. Yeah, that's ground floor, and then you can see the green wall from the 
upstairs, little more private working area. Yeah. That's the second part of the green wall, which I think um, looking at the building now in comparison to the existing pictures, it looks a lot brighter. Um, introducing the roof lights has really helped not just the green wall, but also the space to be used for working much nicer than it was beforehand, really. Yeah, that's um, the kitchen space, which is actually a really big discussion in the design process, because originally um, the kitchen and everything else we fitted was all um, certified in order to get the scar rating. We needed all the timber to be FSC rated and everything like this. And that was all good until we decided to change the worktop and actually no one um, looked at the certification beforehand. So it turns out that little things like this can actually lose you your FSC rating. So we had to work around this quite a lot in order to achieve all the goals that we were looking at, which I think is quite interesting to see how SCAR rating does help you, but how if you want to achieve SCAR rating, you have to look at it from every aspect in every little thing you put into the building, really. Fantastic. Thank you, Nadine. Shall I take over now? Yeah, that's it from my side, really. Brilliant. So as you can see, it's a wonderful building to be in. And a little plug, it is available to hire because it is there to be um, a collaborative space. So we weren't able, obviously, for people to use it uh, last year or earlier this year, sorry. But since September, we have been open and um, yeah, it's available for use. So please come and use it. So to let's let you know a little bit more about the project itself, as well as the sustainability hub being a living lab. So we've actually got people in there working on the green wall working on the, um, the PVs that are on the roof, um, the building management system. We also have this program of carbon reduction across the campus, but we also very importantly have support for Devon companies um, around working with our academics, but also a program of events and internships, which I'll just quickly cover now. So we have available for Devon companies, three months fully funded internships. So for students or recent graduates who placed in your company, working on developing a low carbon product or a low carbon project of some way. And while they're in that uh, placement with you, they also undertake a few future fit leadership programs. So they're learning um, whilst they're within the organization, they're bringing skills to yours, but also learning it at the same time. Um, and we're running our next two um, groups of these uh, in 2022. Excuse the phone, sorry. Um, the current cohort um, is finishing at the end of December and actually Mitchell Architects, um, who Nadine used to work for, are actually hosting an intern at the moment, which is really exciting. Um, we have four industrial research fellows employed in the project, all of whom are working with local Devon companies around these particular headings. So power electronics, the green walls, as you've seen, energy efficiency in buildings and also the creative sector. And also we have innovation funding. So we have funding available to enable Devon companies to access other expertise at the University of Plymouth. So something that's not covered by those four areas I've just shown to help those Devon companies develop new products or services. Um, the strap line really is collaboration, research and then innovation. So round one for the Devon Net Zero Innovation Fund is now closed, but we're about to announce round two. We have a series of events which we've held throughout 2021, um, not just the Future Plymouth events that we're involved with, but also other particular specific low carbon Devon events. You can click on this link here to see the events we've had. A lot of those are online, so they're recorded. So you can go onto our YouTube channel, the Sustainable Earth Institute YouTube channel and see those replayed. But we also have more happening. So these events are intended to inspire action. We have a series of B Corps workshops happening at the moment. And Miles um, is actually one of our um, companies that are actually taking part in B Corps. So it's actually how to become a certified B Corps organization. Um, and in 2022, we're looking at running some more workshops around carbon footprinting, life cycle assessment, and the sustainable development goals action manager. And we're looking at running these in collaboration with other organizations. 
Um, so I think when Doug was talking, he was talking about support and advice for Devon companies. We're very much aware that there are many organizations that are now beginning to be able to um, support businesses in their journey to net zero. So for example, we're looking at working with Southwest Manufacturing and Advisory Service, Swimmers. We wanna make sure we're not duplicating, but we're working in partnership. So really, uh, I want you to consider what is your next step? Um, obviously today we've heard a lot about retrofitting and the challenges of retrofit, the fact that there's such a monumental retrofit effort needed in the UK to reach net zero by 2050. Um, and how do we get there? One thing that the Low Carbon Devon Project can hopefully support or work with is just hot off the press. We've been talking to PEC, Plymouth Energy Community, and also Building Plymouth um, this week about putting on an event in early 2022 about retrofitting opportunities. So it's a massive challenge, but that challenge represents opportunity. Um, and I think there could be some really useful links as well with um, Retrofit Academy and the work that, that they're doing through that, um, the funding we now have to support Devon upskilling. So just to finish, if after today anything occurs to you, any questions that you have for Nadine or for myself, please feel free to email us here at sustainabilityhub at plymouth.ac.uk and I can pass your questions on to Nadine. Um, but also if you want to be involved with the project, if you'd like to have an intern or if you'd like to find out more about the Devon Net Zero Innovation Fund, um, please register. Um, on our expression of interest, just to register your interest to find out more about the project, but also please feel free to follow us on LinkedIn, We've got a LinkedIn page, which is at Low Carbon Devon. Um, and that's it from us. Thank you, Miles. Thanks so much, guys, uh, Nadine and Claire. Um, and yes, I can honestly say um, it's an amazing building. I've been enjoying going there for the last four, four weeks, uh, doing my B Corp course. Still a bit more work to do, but uh, hopefully uh, are going to get certified soon but it's a fantastic building uh, go and see it go and walk past it if you're near the university and have a look at green walls amazing um, so we're going to go for our q a now please keep questions coming in again this it's been a fantastic evening a lot of, lot of uh, exchanges going on uh, and connections which is great um, just a little reminder uh, for our future programs if You've probably been on our website, but it's futureplymouth2030.co.uk. Uh, and there you can see all our future programs coming up. They may switch around, but these are the, definitely the topics that we want to we wanna cover. So please sign up for them. Uh, but just by clicking on them, clicking the register button, and then you'll be put on for that, um, for that uh, program and you'll be reminded when it's on. We've also got all our past uh, webinars as well. So... Um, there's lots of content here uh, and all on our YouTube channel so you can watch back. Or if you'd just like to receive news and updates on um, our, our series, but also from our partners, um, please put your email address in there. We won't spam you, spam you often. It's, it's really, really, really crucial, uh, really interesting information. So please sign up there uh, on our website. And also have a look at our speakers as well. You can check out all our speakers and all our all their bios and stuff. It's great. So I'm going to invite all our panelists back uh, and unmute them all uh, as we've got some questions. So cool. Thanks for coming back, guys. Uh, and thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, so first question, um, probably to you, David and Jenny. Um, are there any uh, construction standards, uh, e.g. Uh, BREAM or SKA, that uh, see retrofitting as a benefit that can be used alongside retrofit? Uh, currently undergoing a retrofit of a building, but it doesn't seem to quite meet the uh, SKA requirements within the project. That's one for me, Jen, I think, isn't it? <laughs> um, right, I'm not an expert in this area. Um, there are there are specific standards, performance standards for retrofit, which um, to a greater or lesser extent are there's, there's an NFIT, something called the NFIT standard, which is the passive house standard, for example, is effectively the, the equivalent of passive house new build standard, but for retrofit, which is pretty good, but it's a very, very ambitious and hard to achieve target. It's it's more flexible than passive house, but it's still really challenging. Um, and the, the, my point about earlier about how 
we need to do this in stages in most cases because unless we've got a hundred thousand pounds to throw at a project right now which doesn't happen very often achieving those sorts of um targets is is beyond most budgets right now now specifically i'm not familiar with ska forgive me i don't know anything about that um briam is um, there is a briam retrofit in fact i used to manage a briam retrofit excellent uh, building so um and despite that despite the fact that we were very proud of it and shouted it from the rooftops it's not actually that great a um methodology um and it really sort of rewards as many of these things do rewards many of the wrong kind of things <laughs> so it may have may have been updated then so i'm going back five years or so there when we last engaged with it but um briam is the only one that directly is relevant to retrofit i believe maybe i can say something to that please do that's what we just did with the scar rating um but that's only non-domestic projects so that's like that's why i don't know anything about it yeah that's so that's like what we did for university for example and i guess we actually chose it exactly for the reason you said about the preamp um because the sky is actually less looking at just what you put in and putting it in it's more looking at analyzing what's already there so um I don't know about the project, but for us, it was really handy to use the SCAR rating because it actually just, you have to do an assessment of everything you take out. It's also taking into consideration like your waste management, how the site is managed. This, um, so the contractors involved as well, they have to certify, they have to be considered construction um, registered, they have to do their courses. And it's all about reducing um, like being sustainable, not just in the building, but in the process. So actually, can furniture be re reused? Can it be recycled? Can it be used for something else? Does the waste go to landfill or does it not go to landfill? Can it be separated? And is it actually also good for the people working there? So I guess that's why we chose the SCAR rating over the others. Thanks, guys. Hope that answers your question. Um, brilliant one coming in. This is open up to a whole panel, actually. Thank you, AJ, for this question. I'm going to come to you, Claire, first. Um, so, so AJ says, with, with such high levels of employment, uh, how do we build a new generation of young technicians, designers, and specialists to, to join the retrofit green army? Let's open up to a whole panel. But Claire, do you have anything on that? <laughs> um, for Retrofit, I know at the moment, is within the curriculum at the university in the obviously the relevant um, courses. So that is fantastic. But I think that obviously the profile needs to raise will be risen on that. Um, and having had contact with, for example, the interns and the other students and graduates that we work with on the project, there is such an appetite for sustainability. So those who are looking at getting into construction, they want to do it. You can tell that. It's just making sure that the, the skills training is there for them. Thanks, Claire. Would anyone else like to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, very much our domain. Um, so, you know, we... we um, as a how did you get into it, David? How did I get into retrofit skills? That's a really good question. <laughs> Uh, I was an exhibition organizer who uh, got, I was organizing shows in, in this sort of green space and became a uh, uh, game gamekeeper term poacher, I think is the right way around. Um, and um, I, I mean, the, the, the universities, I, I'd sort of, um, universities and colleges are central to all of this. And I always really sympathize with people who work for them. I don't think I could do it because institutionally things tend to happen at quite a slow pace um forget i don't mean to offend anybody when i say that but I, I mean i work with lots of academics who share that frustration with me um and it, probably what it takes is an organization like ours and maybe some others to come up with some stuff that that can get adopted and, and introduced um into the curricula of those uh, those institutions i think probably is is a, is a really good thing so we'll be doing lots of and that's what the 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 um retrofit academy in devon that will be setting up we'll be working with those existing providers to help do that rather than us deliver everything ourselves we can't train two hundred thousand people in the next eight years by doing it ourselves so it's about collaboration with others thanks david um 
this one, Pamela, uh, I'm going to come to you, Doug, for this one. But again, open up to our panel. Um, given the cost of retrofits for homes, is there an argument in some cases to remove homes and rebuild them to new standards? Uh, how does that measure up in terms of carbon emissions from that construction? Yeah, it's very tempting, isn't it, um, to think that um, it might be better to start from scratch, but um, no, it's not due to the embodied carbon that is involved in, in constructing a new property throughout the whole supply chain. You know, so you, even if you were to construct a new property um, out of very sustainable materials, you know, wood and sheep's wool with insulation, things like that, um, there's still an awful lot of energy that's used in the supply chain. Um, and so, no, we, what we need to do is, is make our current homes as comfortable um, and as well insulated as possible. And there are examples of how it can be done. You know, there are Georgian properties, there are Victorian properties that have been retrofitted very well. Um, and they've created very comfortable indoor environments. There have also been uh, studies and, and pilots done locally in Devon on Dartmoor, looking at sort of Dartmoor longhouses and cob construction and rubble stone construction. It can be done. Um, and in terms of yeah, carbon accounting, in terms of carbon, it is much better to do that than to, to knock down and start again. And you're actually building a cob house next to the sustainability hub, aren't you, Claire? Yes, we are, which you probably could see. Yes, you come in. It's, it's coming along nicely, actually. Yeah, really I wanted, I was, yes, I was going to mention it. I thought, no, it's not retrofit, it's a new build. But yes, it's investigating, basically. We had a research project that's basically uh, developed a, 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 Sort of the best practice when it comes to cob uh, it's a project with um university in france and also uh cob builders so yeah that's going up at the moment very exciting i'm not quite sure on the completion i think it's early next year so again if anybody wants to come and see the hub and see the building site it's very exciting it is really interesting uh, thanks Claire. thank you doug um again across the whole panel probably david jenny uh this one um uh Really interested in how we support uh, skill development and uptake in existing tradespeople as well as new workforce. Uh, my vision for retrofit is that when a householder contacts a trade person for some work in their home, that person will be skilled in retrofit and will support the householder to opt in for sustainability and energy saving so that from ASAP all works come from retrofit essence. Would you share that vision? How do we get to that? <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I think retrofit should be the, the, the default, yeah. you know, sort of uh, the installer sector, um, you know, people across construction, retrofit needs to be at the fore of everyone's minds, really, so that proper, you know, proper advice can be given to people who are interested in, in, in whatever it is that they're interested in. There's no point replacing windows if actually you could make that part of a medium term retrofit plan, um, use that money really wisely rather than a one off measure actually use it towards something that is going to um, make a make a real impact on your carbon emissions and the, the climate and also the value of your house and the cost savings you'll, you'll generate and having a much nicer place to live. Um, so I, I would I would be all for that. I think um, you have to distinguish between um, um, People on the front line of construction of people on the front line of construction um, giving giving advice that might be related to retrofit. You have to distinguish that from retrofit advice um, in terms of the PAS role. So there is a professional role um, in the PAS called retrofit advisor. They are the people who will be providing that expert retrofit advice um, to clients and the public around what, what is the best way to, to, to retrofit um, and doing that customer service role really well. That's a slightly different thing to providing some advice to, to somebody about retrofit when you're on the front line. But I don't think there's, there's any harm at all in all those people who are on the front line and sort of in contact with, with people wanting to do stuff to their houses, actually knowing about retrofit. I think that'll be a great thing. There's a lot of awareness raising I think we need to do here. Yeah, that's already agreed, Jenny. Would anyone else like to come in on that? No, great. Well, thank you so much uh, to our panel and thank you to everyone who's asked any questions this evening. Uh, it's been a great programme. Uh, join us again next time for on the 15th of December, our last one of this year. God, where's the year gone? Um, the topic will be or it might change, but it probably will be net zero carbon futures from a creative perspective. Perspective. That's uh, uh, December the 15th at four o'clock. Uh, thank you all so much. Have a lovely evening and we'll see you next time.
Bye bye.